One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. One morning in April, I took a train from Moscow to a town called Gagarin. This is where the popular version of how the Russians conquered space begins. In the otherwise nondescript town they've named after their hero. On April the 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to go into space. It was the height of the Cold War. No one could say it wasn't a triumph for communism. It was a new emotion, which is impossible, I think, to describe in detail. It was... Something really great for everybody happened, and perhaps a little hope that new times started from this day. But all this razzmatazz tells only half the story. Finding out about the other half, the unspoken half, took me on a strange journey. A journey into a Russian world where mysticism and science merge and nothing is certain, not even death. So what, the, the, the heads are down underneath there somewhere? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to die because uh, it's not pleasant, it's not nice, nothing good happens out of it, at least for the person who dies. What links the two is a dream of the future. See, I can't use it anymore. In which science would make us all immortal. It's getting dark, too dark to see. And supermen would rule the universe. And I feel like I'm knocking on heaven's door. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. It was not where I expected to start a story on space. But this is the only place where you can find a statue in the main street to the man some people say is the true father of space travel in Russia. No, not him. This man, a 19th century sage called Nikolai Fyodorov, and the inspiration of a uniquely Russian view of the world called cosmism. Alexander Boyko is a cosmist. Some of the movement's early heroes adorn the walls of the town. The core of their idea was that the whole universe is alive and that man is inseparable from it. Они видели отрицательное представление о Земле, о их разрушениях, о том, а что что человек все больше и больше захламляет, уничтожает. И смотря в телескопы, они видели бесконечность. И почему туда не попасть? And this is now. 
the current queen of cosmism held court, we discovered, in a children's library. Her name is Anastasia Gacheva. That's Fyodorov, and would you believe it? He came from a long line, not of Fyodorovs, but of princes called Gagarin. And it was the wide horizons around that oak tree, said Anastasia, which first inspired Fyodorov to think beyond the limit. Wow. Anastasia said she had something she wanted to show me. Not old documents about Fyodorov, as I expected, but a 50-year-old front page announcing that the Soviet Union had just put a man into space. The captain of the first spaceship. It's ours, Soviet. A great victory for thought and hard work. The world applauds Yuri Gagarin. Вот это символическое совпадение в этой метафизической истории, конечно, очень важно. Вот это вот совпадение удивительное, что Гагарин, предвосхитивший выход человечества в космос, философски, этически обосновавший эту идею, и Юрий Гагарин, который стал первым космонавтом планеты Земля, вот, увидевший Землю, как бы благословивший эту Землю, что вот так вот они сошлись. Anastasia said she had a friend she thought I should meet. He was hard to miss, even in the Moscow traffic. His name was Valery Borisov, and apparently he knew everything there was to know about Fyodorov's domestic life. But Fyodorov led a double life, working in places like this, living like a pauper. Кто бывал в тех местах, где он жил, поражались, конечно. Он снимал не то, чтобы квартира обычно, а угол. Спал на чемодане. And he ate like a saint, said Valery, just bread, tea, and water. Говорят, что его даже он умер благодаря из-за того, что его друзья поклонники однажды в мороз заставили его одеть шубу, и он спотел и простудился пневмония и сгорел он. Devout Christians like Fyodorov faced a dilemma in those days. Outside the churches, society hovered on the cusp between ancient and modern. Most of them feared that science would destroy their religion. Fyodorov's genius was to enlist it in support. <laughs> Valery had invited me to visit him in his garden. Oh, George. It turned out to be less of an organic creation, more of a dream world. 
эта клумба называется круг земной. То есть земля это и есть вообще прах всего здесь живущего. Строго говоря, <coughs> земля вот эта плодородная, хумус, это и есть останки умерших. Вот почему Федоров говорил, что наше прошлое это наша ценность. Was it just the cruelty of April, I wondered, or a symbol? Fyodor thought that science should help us to complete the divine plan of salvation and the resurrection of man. Christ said, "What I have done, you will do, and more than that, you will do." And what did Christ do? He resurrected. That is, if we understand it literally, then what Fyodor Christ promised us: "Do not wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, as a shadow of the Lord has said." как мистического события воскрешения, а самим пойти навстречу Бога и следовать проблему смерти. Федоров говорил, что ну, если всех воскресить, они не поместятся на Земле. И Федоров прозорливо говорил, в космосе отыщется много обителей. Вот. Вот для чего нужен космос. Космос это выходы для расселения безжизненных планет воскрешенными людьми, которые будут заниматься управлением космического процесса. Not exactly a gateway to paradise. Hi, hello. The man who greeted me was called Danila Medvedev. His group call themselves transhumanists. And they believe they can do what Fyodorov promised. Live forever, thanks to science. This is a temporary dry storage box or cooling box. Um, it can be used for that as well. You put a body in for how long? Uh, a couple of months. Uh, we use this one. This is a small one, so we keep the you know, those patients who stored only their head or brain here. What? So you you get the body and cut the head off, do you? Uh, yes. Yeah, I see. So, so. this is the one in there now. Yes, there are a couple of patients there, and they have been here uh, for five years. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Is it possible to look for? Yes, so. Uh... So what, the, the, the heads are down underneath there somewhere? Yes, uh, they are, you can see, 14 web sure. And uh, below that is liquid nitrogen, and uh, submerged in liquid nitrogen are metal containers with the patient's heads or brains inside. Confident fellow to call them patients. Most people tend uh, to assume that if something is impossible today, it will never be possible in the future. Uh, we have the opposite uh, way of thinking. We think that some technologies, uh, some uh, significant things that we want to happen uh, can basically be taken for granted. Just not now, in the future. Outside, it was like a set from some dystopic movie. He'd come to cryology, he told me, from investment banking. What do you want to be immortal for? Um, I just don't want to die. That's, uh, it doesn't make sense to die, uh, because uh, it's not pleasant, it's not nice, nothing good happens out of it, um, uh, at least for the person who dies. Wouldn't you get bored? No, I wouldn't get bored so much that it would make uh, eternal life bad on balance. And um, now we store the patients uh, in free, pay, free full body patients here in this uh, container. So. But bodies to Danila are already yesterday's technology. His version of Fyodorov's dream is to upload his identity into a computer file and live forever in cyberspace. Since humanists uh, don't care about uh, having a body, they care about becoming post-humans. As we get closer and closer to actually becoming post-humans, uh, uploading ourselves into computers, uh, then it doesn't actually matter where you 
where your brain uh, resides because uh, it's running inside the computer and it doesn't matter if the computer is uh, inside the moon or inside the earth. Somehow I felt Fyodorov might find something more spiritual in mind. I think the general idea is uh, we are following his plan. He said science uh, should find a way to deal with death and uh, we are doing that. Would there still be good and evil in your futuristic world? I don't think that if you have sufficient intelligence uh, that uh, you can have evil, because uh, usually evil happening in the world is the result of either lack of intelligence or lack of other resources. Uh, smart people who have uh, uh, healthy brain, uh, they don't commit bad things if they have enough resources. So you, you, it would be a world for rich, healthy people, would it? Uh, it would be a world of rich, uh, healthy people, not for rich, healthy people. That's revisionism for you. I headed back into the 19th century, to the great Romanciev Library over the road from the Kremlin. As a special favor, Anastasia had arranged for me to be taken up to the very top, through the roof rafters to the balcony from which Fyodorov had contemplated the heavens. What a view. No wonder his thoughts turned to space travel. Он мечтал о том, чтобы здесь, вот на Бельведере Пашкова дома, была воздвигнута обсерватория, которая бы обращала нас уже в космос. И вот Кремль как орудие регуляции, так он мечтал. A sort of mystical mission control. Fyodorov, it was emerging, had an obsession with controlling things. Very Russian. Fyodorov говорил о том, что две ограниченности фундаментальных существуют у человека и человеческого рода. Ограниченность в пространстве, которая не позволяет нам одновременно быть в разной точке пространства, и ограниченность во времени, наша смертность. И вот преодолеть две эти ограниченности в пространстве и во времени, в этом и состоит задача будущего. Будущей науки, будущей искусства, будущей культуры человека. We went down to the reading room. For 20 years, Fyodorov worked here as a senior librarian. Today's librarian brought some rare old papers out from the vault for me to see. Это рукописи Фёдорова. Часть из них это письма к нему. Это материалы для книги Философия общего дела. The common task. That was what he called the search for eternal life through science. I can't, gosh, I can't read it. But I think I can read that. About universal Vascrasenia, that's resurrection. Too hard for me. My friend Teresa did rather better. This line, which separates the two parts of the drawing, seems to say the transition from blindness and lack of ability to be in charge of your own destiny to self-direction, self-regulation, and self-government. And when you cross that line, then you're in the ideal world where you have the resurrection of everybody, the unification of worlds. Fyodorov wrote very little down. What makes him significant is the influence he had on other great thinkers. Вот Фёдор, вы видите, с каталожным ящиком на столе, а Толстой беседует с ним, и какие-то, наверное, заказы ему дают на книге. This is actually a letter written by Dostoevsky, and it's written to uh, Fyodorov's pupil, Pettersen. And it says here, I have just become acquainted with the ideas of this great thinker, and I would very much appreciate that you could convey to him how much his ideas have absolutely enthralled me. And he's saying that when I read these ideas, and when I understand what they mean, I feel as though they are completely part of me, that they are close to my heart, they could be mine. Dostoevsky. That's Dostoevsky about Fyodorov's philosophy and the ideas. But the person who injected those ideas into the bloodstream of Russian science was a near-deaf teenager who came here to study because he couldn't keep up at school. 
His name was Konstantin Silkovsky. Но он жил очень бедно, все свои деньги тратил на опыт. Он приходил сюда, и брюки его были пружены кислотой, а руки запачканы чернилами. И вот он подавал, так сказать, требования на книги. For three years, Fyodorov helped the young Silkovsky choose books to improve his mind. Мы не знаем, говорили ли они о космосе, говорил ли Федоров здесь, в этих стенах, Циолковскому о том, что человеческий род должен выйти за пределы Земли. Циолковский вспоминал о том, что Федоров произвел на него потрясающее впечатление своим обликом, своим внешним обликом, своей горячностью, своим умом. This is the park in Moscow that celebrates the official story of space. Pride of place among the steel and granite memories goes to that same deaf boy, Konstantin Silkovsky. The kids must think he thrived under the regime that erected this monument, but it simply isn't true. For most of his life, Silkovsky lived in the sticks, unrecognized, unrewarded. And there he would probably have stayed, but for one extraordinary insight. I was looking for an article about rocket propulsion that Tsiolkovsky had published in the very year that Fyodorov died. This is why he's famous. Look at the date, 1903, May. An article published in an obscure science journal in Russia, full of calculations for deciding how much you need to and propel the rocket, what speed you need to get to, what fuel you need to get out of the Earth's atmosphere. And amazingly, he wrote that seven months before the Wright brothers had even flown a yard. But virtually no one took any notice. To find out why, I made my way to a dacha outside Moscow. Inside was Alexander Urnov, grandson of the man who helped save Tsiolkovsky's stroke of genius from oblivion. Sasha, hi. Good morning. Would you like to have fun? I'd love some. That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Oh, this is just my grandfather. Oh, let's see. Okay. And this is your grandfather as well, is it? Oh, yes. In those days, Boris Varabyov was quite a man about town. He lived in this house of Pushkin Square and was into every new trend. We lived in the same apartment. His room was called Dedova Komnata, the so grandfather's room. And uh, we came, my brother and, uh, and me, from time to time to him and got him a lot of questions. As the transport revolution advanced, his grandfather decided to launch a magazine specializing in aviation. Somebody said to him that there is one dreamer who thinks about the exploration of the space, of flights to the moon. He wrote him a letter inviting him to write something for his journal. And Tsiolkovsky wrote a very detailed paper saying that, he, yes, he has materials, he has scientific works, and uh, uh, about explorations of the, sp of the space, not, not only aviation, but much like universe, I would say. Editorial board was shocked. This person is thinking about exploration of, of universe because at that time it seems to be were much more important problems on the Earth. Indeed, there were. Russia was entering the death throes of its imperial age. But the paper was published, and Tsiolkovsky wrote to thank Alexander's grandfather. This letter from Tsiolkovsky started uh, with the words that Человечество не останется вечно на Земле, но в погоне за светом и пространством сначала робко проникнет за пределы атмосферы, а затем завоюет себе все около солнечное пространство. This person is speaking like a prophet, and it's true, he became a prophet actually. Once again, his article went unnoticed, submerged beneath the turmoil of revolution. 
But with peace came a brief utopian period when to dream of new worlds seemed perfectly normal. Just period of 20th, starting from the revolution, it was as spirit of the time. You know, uh, people um, uh, were enthusiastic about changing of everything. This is one of the places the intellectuals of the new age used to meet. An art center then, and an art center of sorts now. The band call themselves Cosmies, retro utopians. But back in the 20s, the place was full of the real thing. Artists, musicians, writers, poets and filmmakers who found the idea of cosmism intoxicating. They queued round the block when Alita, Queen of Mars, came out in 1924. For example, very rich people and very famous people, they supported Bolsheviks, just by money, funding, etc. Because everybody would like change what we see now here into something different. So people were going to make trips to unknown places to discover something. It was great enthusiasm. And it was an atmosphere in which Tsiolkovsky would at last prosper. Photos of... Oh, let me see that. It's his grandson. Uh, oh, really? Tsiolkovsky and his grandson? Yeah. Gosh. That's a rare picture. I mean, it's just written what that this, this, on, this what, is what unique. What does it say on the back? Konstantin Eduardovich Tselkovsky, seven to one, with his grandson. In his old age, his ideas for space travel were finally being taken seriously. But utopia was over. He cannot be philosopher because uh, uh, it was a period when we had only one philosophy, or Marx philosophy, so um, you should be very cautious. Mm. Either you became very famous, uh, it means that Stalin will look at it positively, or you just will be prisoned or killed. Tsiolkovsky didn't care. He knew he was near the end anyway, but he did want a state pension to look after his wife. Somebody gave him an idea to write a letter directly to Stalin. And uh, it seems to me he did it, and Stalin answered. And since this answer was, was made from Stalin directly, uh, even Stalin wrote in Russian, Velikomu Dietilu Nauki. So he got his pension, a medal, and two years later, a grand state funeral. Space establishment is celebrating Cosmonauts Day. Many of these people have spent their entire working lives in total secrecy, making rockets, but to launch warheads more often than men. This was their annual happy hour, celebrating their heroes. though not quite in the way I was expecting. I saw Georgi Gretschko in the audience. He was one of the first Russians to walk in space. He told me something intriguing. When he was young, many of the books by the man they now called the father of space travel were virtually banned. Tsiolkovsky, кроме того, что он занимался вот межпланетными сообщениями, он еще был философом. Причем с точки зрения, значит, нашей философии, он неправильный был философ. And why was that? Он увлекался Евгеникой. Он считал, что 
человечество надо селектировать, хороших отбирать, пусть развиваются, плохих, значит, в другую сторону. Как же так делить людей на способных, на неспособных, значит, способных выращивать там, способствовать размножению, а неспособных что, вообще решать жизни? This is the city where Tsiolkovsky lived for most of his life, fretting about money and the future of mankind. I'd arranged to meet his great-grandson, Sergei Samburov. Understandably, perhaps, he wanted to meet at the great museum of space they've built in Tsiolkovsky's honor. Tsiolkovsky died before a scrap of this stuff was built, of course. But the myth is everything. Tsiolkovsky is establishment now. And so up to a point is his great-grandson, who has a good job in the prestigious space industry. After a few minutes looking around, he said there was something he wanted to show me in the park along the road. What is this place? What is this? It's a mogila. Где похоронен Цалковский? Monument to an incorrect philosopher. I asked Sergei which had been most important to him, his rockets or his blueprint for the human race. Он ракеты, вот форму как бы написал за один вечер, то есть он только значения никакого не передавал, потому что она простая формула, и он владея высшей математикой, поэтому для него проблем не было, и он думал только о том, чтобы все человечество расселилось во Вселенной, и было счастливо. Вот он на счастье человечества думал. This house became a shrine for every Russian cosmonaut. This is where Tsiolkovsky sat, and where us cosmonauts who are going into space as a special favor are allowed to sit. Смотрите, усилитель звука, можете тихонько я послушаю. Скажите, нет, вы оттуда оттуда скажите что-нибудь. Посмотрите, вот тут не было интернета, не было компьютера. У него была только керосиновая лампа. И вот в таких при керосиновой лампе всю эту космонавтику, все расписать и все сходится, это действительно надо каким-то быть таким гениальным человеком, чтобы все это вот написать здесь. Tsiolkovsky, unlike Fyodorov, never stopped writing on whatever engaged his inquisitive mind. But a recurrent theme was how to save humanity when the planet died. Он считал, что солнце наше со временем погаснет, а мы перестанем получать энергию. И земля тоже, значит, останется мертвым, мертвой будет, и поэтому жить невозможно. Поэтому надо расселяться, улетать другим солнцем. Он писал, как будет развиваться человечество все, как станет более умный, более добрый, более счастливый. Вот в основном он про это писал и призывал всех расселяться в космосе, чтобы там жить более счастливо. Он считал люди, которые ну, вот, наркоманы пьют, от них еще рождаются дети, они тоже становятся какие-то ну, не, не умные, и, ну, и он считал это не очень правильно. Он говорил, что они, человек, такие люди должны жить в семье, но у них не должно быть плохого потомства. Один гений может новые придумать виды энергии, новые виды транспорта, ну, ну то есть много нового что-то придумать, человека жизнь увеличить намного там раз. Он считал, что таких надо выискивать одаренных и специально их вот как бы заботиться о них. This is a man who would have fitted the bill. 
the old cold warriors were paying their respects to the engineer who led them into space. On the face of it, Sergei Korolev was like them, shunning the limelight to serve the state. But would he tell us his name? I went to see Karilov's daughter, who lived on the 14th floor of a smart block of flats in the center of town. She sat down to show me the family photographs. Он был человеком очень сильным, не в плане физической силы, а сильным по своему убеждению. Вот он окончил школу летчиков в форме пилота. С самого раннего детства он стремился покорить небо и шел к этому всю жизнь. Сначала были планеры, потом самолеты, потом ракеты. Karyanov and his friends had caught the space bug that was sweeping Russia. But their work had nothing to do with the Soviet state. Это были энтузиасты, и вначале никакой поддержки правительства не было, и они создали группу инженеров, работающих даром, потому что они после основной работы вечерами занимались конструированием ракет. The turning point came when a shrewd general spotted the military potential. They got a small grant to rent the cellar of that building. В неприспособленном московском подвале возник научный центр с опытным производством, чтобы построить и запустить первую советскую жидкостную ракету. The half truths of hindsight. What actually happened was that their military protector fell from grace. And on June the 27th, 1938, the secret police turned up at the Karilov's flat on the top floor of this building. Мама пришла домой, уже она видела, у подъезда стояли два человека. Отец был дома, и она ему сказала об этом, а он сказал, это наверняка за мной. Они поужинали, не зажигая света, и потом полдвенадцатого ночи раздался стук в двери. Предъявили ордер на арест и обыск, и после этого начали все переворачивать в квартире. Естественно, там нечего было искать, ничего не нашли. Опечатали одну комнату, кабинет моего отца, и его увели. Did he think he was going to be executed? Да, безусловно. One minute of bright young hope for the future. The next, hard labor in one of the worst camps in the Gulag. Это алюминиевая кружка, которая была с ним в лагере на Колыме, и которую он привез, когда он вернулся оттуда. Здесь на, на ручке нацарапано королев. The man who saved his life, ironically, was the secret police boss, Lavrenti Beria, the one on the right. He saw that using the state's best scientists to break rocks or build railways wasn't exactly in the national interest. So he had him transferred to Moscow. I found the place where he was sent, here on Radio Street. That's the building, a sort of prison laboratory for brainy traitors. The plaque says that the famous aircraft designer Andrei Tupolov worked here for years. What it doesn't say is that he too was a prisoner, charged with wrecking state enterprises. The only fresh air Korolev got then was up there on the roof. Now he stands in the park, showered in Soviet honors. But deep down, I wondered, had this supremely practical man shared any of the incorrect tendencies of his granite companion? Был свидетель, человек, который провожал его к дому Циолковского, моего отца. И есть нескольким людям мой отец рассказывал, 
частности, моей маме, моей бабушке, своему другу, одному другому. Он рассказывал о, о посещении Циолковского. Он писал, что я ушел от него с одной мыслью строить ракеты и летать на них. Отныне целью моей жизни стало одно – пробиться к звездам. But even if the only immortality he dreamed of was fame, that great day still had a bitter taste. Отцу моему в душе, конечно, было очень обидно, что его имя никогда нигде не звучало. Он назывался просто главный конструктор. Из-за этой секретности ему пришлось ехать домой, и он смотрел митинг по телевизору. And Korolev wasn't the only person with mixed feelings. Fyodorov's followers still have their eyes on a bigger prize. Борьба со смертью, бессмертие, воскрешение. Космос – это только инструмент. Это это цветочки, это как бы мелочь. Существенно она поражает, что и поражает его пророческой состоятельностью, но это не самое главное. In the optimistic aftermath of Gagarin's flight, building accelerated on a new town in the Siberian forest. It's called Akademgorodok. It was built as a place for scientists to live as one big community, as a place for generating ideas. They wanted to create a paradise for scientists so that uh, they would feel safe and um, comfortable here. Artyom was taking me to Izrika, a research institute where the DNA of Tilkovsky and Fyodorov has survived everything. Do you know much about Izrika itself? I know what my mom's been doing. What's that? She's been trying to figure out uh, ways of distant communicating uh, between human mind and uh, other cosmic consciousness sees in the universe, in the universe. Gosh, I see. You, so you, how to communicate from someone on Earth to some sort of being elsewhere in... Right, right. <laughs> His mother and the boss, Alexander Trofimov, were in the middle of an experiment. On my right, a large aluminium wall. In front of it, a technician monitoring brainwaves. Their theory is that objects give out information about themselves. They've placed one inside what they call the transmission zone. And there is the receiver. <laughs> Ощущения чувствую, пока... Ощущения невесомости полета. Очень приятное чувство как-то скорости, наверное. Пока мне сложно сориентироваться в этом еще. Знаешь ли ты, где ты был, Антон, сегодня? А, да. Рассматриваю ее, как Луну держу, как глобус в руках. Я рассматриваю ее, поворачиваю, могу рассмотреть, приблизить. Отдалить. Такое вот ощущение. Ты знал, что тебе предстоит? Какая, какая задача сегодня? Нет. Антон, ты сегодня был вот по этому адресу. Вот эта фотография mm -hmm. у нас была в зоне трансляции информации. Вы много раз сегодня ее увидите в работе эту зону. Но в данном случае ты прав. They call the chamber that Anton sat in a Kozirov mirror named after an astrophysicist who spent 11 years in the Gulag. Cut off from other scientists, he developed his own unorthodox theories. One was that all cosmic matter is ceaselessly communicating with itself. And what they believe here is that laser beams and anti-magnetic chambers like this help them tune into that information network. 
One of their heroes is Vladimir Vernadsky, a contemporary of Tsiolkovsky's, who said there was a third dimension of the cosmos, beyond things and living creatures, which he called the noosphere, or sphere of the mind. And that, say this branch of the cosmos, is where to find immortality. The man I needed to see was Alexander's partner, Vlail Kaznachev, the current guru of cosmism. He's now in his 80s and too frail to come to the laboratory. But he welcomed us into his house and began to explain how cosmism had evolved. In our work, especially Vladimir Ivanovich Vernadsky, it was said in physics, physical time. А в интеллекте, в живом веществе, другое понятие пространства и времени. В наших работах в Институте космической антропоэкологии пытаемся понять, как человеческий интеллект связан с полями космическими. Человек сам является колоссально научным непознанным прибором. И он с, с этим интеллектом должен идти свободно. I thought I'd better give it a try myself. They tested my reactions. They measured my cosmic aura. All of your parameters are normal. Green shows normal yes. level. And then I went into the mirrors. This is it. Please make a pause and ma uh, ma make a, a stop, a little stop, and just uh, put yourself to relax, relaxation. Say hello to this information system and find inside yourself what are you looking for, and you will find the answers inside. Just sit here and make some questions that you can ask this system with help of mind of the universe. Make this conversation with universal mind. Okay. Okay. See you later. See you later. Может быть, наоборот, это новый шаг. Мы еще во сне не экспериментировали в пространстве. Правда, у вас ни один человек там не спал? Еще, у нас еще запланированы ночные работы под звездным небом. Может быть, Джордж как раз будет первый открывать. Let's finish this contact. Well, it was peaceful. Yeah. I knew it. Так просто не войти. Отмычка не сработает, не скроешь это пространство. Нужно подготовить свое сердце, свою душу, научиться запечатлевать. Итак, было бы с чем туда входить, заинтересовать пространство в себе, в своей личности. Это по Федорову формула, да? И тогда это получится. Таисия, with years of practice and faith, had much better results. She showed me the record she kept of the images that had flooded into her head inside the mirror. Задача то здесь стоит в том, чтобы научиться с помощью какой-то разработать метод или способы, которым человек бы научился управлять своим сознанием для того, чтобы это сознание могло двигаться в различном направлении, в том числе попытаться вступить вот как раз с космическим интеллектом, с космофизической средой. I'm beginning to get the idea. We're talking close encounters here. Кроме нас в космосе много интеллекта. Это интеллектуальное пространство. Это много пространств. Мы частицы, и это пространство интеллекта неизвестно, как нас примет или не примет. And that is cosmism today. Man inextricably bound up in the universe, whether he travels through it or stays on Earth. Гениальность или интеллект Циолковского, он открыл этот способ толчка, как проникнуть ракетой в космос. Это одна часть Циолковского. А вторая часть, он рассуждал и видел, куда эта ракета понесет человека. Что значит человеческий интеллект в космосе? 
когда человек полетел туда, то я ощущал это в то время, что это мой интеллект пошел в космос и смотрит на планету Земля сверху, как Бог. Whatever you think of the dreamers, you can't fault the scientific credentials of Alexander Urnov and the Lebedev Institute. Look at that wall lined with Nobel Prize winners who've earned their spurs here. Alexander is a solar physicist working at the cutting edge, and there on the surface of the sun, these cosmic questions are not thought crazy. What are we looking you at? You may see how alive the solar corona is. Yeah. I can I can show you another another example. When international satellites start to explore the sun and they saw the structure of solar corona, they start to speak, people start to speak that solar corona is alive. What do you mean when you say alive or not alive? This is I think one of the question in modern science which is in the frontier. His words felt like a blessing on my whole journey. But he hadn't finished. Fyodorov formulated so great, so fantastically huge idea, which I even cannot compare with anything else. What is the name? Or oh, if somebody thinks different, he have to correct me. What is anything else most important for human being as an answer on the question, what is the sense of your life? And his idea helps to answer this question. The development of knowledge, which science gives you, helps to make you immortal. That is, I think, absolutely beautiful. I don't know anything more beautiful, speaking about ideas. It was time for my pilgrimage to the hometown of the carpenter's son who unwittingly fulfilled Fyodorov's prediction. In the town stadium, they were starting the annual Gagarin Games. Apparently, this was the sort of fun that young Yuri had before PlayStations, television, mobile phones. I bet. That woman, someone told me, was Yuri Gagarin's favorite niece, Tamara. I made a date to meet her at the family house. Когда я появилась на свет, ему было только 13 лет. То есть он мне был как старший брат. Конечно, помню. У нас была корова, куры, кролики там, поросят, огромное очень хозяйство. Здесь был большой сад, разбит огород, овощи были все со своего огорода, фрукты были все со своего огорода. Вот в этом доме мы все и жили. Вот эта комната была. Комната Юра и Бори. Два младшие брата жили вот, как бы в этой комнате. Сейчас обычно вот наши современные дети приходят, спрашивают, а что они спали на одной кровати? На одной. И на такой маленькой, да, на такой маленькой. Young Yuri went off to technical college, got married, and seemed to be doing well as some sort of test pilot. Back here, they had no idea what he was really up to. В школе училась, к нам пришла на перемене наша классная руководитель и спрашивает, слушай, Тамара, у тебя же дядя-то твой военный летчик, да, говорю, военный. Но ты знаешь, он Юрий Алексеевич Гагарин, да, я говорю, да, Юрий Алексеевич Гагарин. Так он в космосе. Мне стало так страшно. У меня такой был ужас, что его может не стать, потому что это черная бездна, это что-то непонятное. Я просто упала на парту, я проплакала его весь. Все идет хорошо, машина работает нормально, прием. Потом она говорит, слушай, 
Ты что плачешь? Уже ж все, уже все, он приземлился, все закончилось, все великолепно. Иди домой, иди. С земли звезд нежен, был и брос, Людям свет, как танкнет. Он сказал, поехали, он смахнул рукой, Словно вдоль по бигерской, бигерской, Ронесся над землей. They celebrate it still, that moment when the Soviet Union excelled America. But it didn't last long. Within the decade, America was overhauling them in space, and Gagarin was dead, killed in a senseless air crash that left the nation distraught. Все, жизнь закончилась. Жить больше незачем. Вот настолько я его любила. Вот говорят, что годы лечат, что боль проходит. Нет, она никогда не пройдет. Единственное, что просто загоняешь куда-то ее далеко вовнутрь. Стараешься бороться, что да. А э, когда вот нахлынут воспоминания, вот эта боль, она точно такая же. Она ничуть не меньше. 50 years on, Gagarin has found a sort of immortality. Forever young, forever smiling. All over Russia, churches have been handed back to Orthodox priests. But here they worship different gods. Вся человеческая цивилизация и наука, она по своей своей природе, она воскресительна. Она борется со временем, она борется с забвением. Чтобы остаться в памяти людей молодым, умным, красивым, надо рано умереть. Вот такая страшная трагедия знаменитых людей. This is the village where Yuri Gagarin was actually born. When he was seven, Nazi armies overran the place. I was told there was someone in the graveyard who'd been his pal when they were boys. And thus, at the end, I learned of the real miracle. That Yuri Gagarin had grown old enough to fly into space at all. Немецкие склады, в складах снаряды в лесу, здесь вот километра четыре отсюда, для того, чтобы цветной металл в магазин сдать на конфетку. The hammer, he said, was for smashing the casings off the explosive heads. Детей, тоже по таких подростков, на телегах у, у жас бывшей, у больницы убитых. Мы отвечаем, они не могут, мы специалисты, они не могут разряжать. Значит, вот не погибли же, я вот вспоминаю, такие неузгоды были, что не погибли. А вот в мирное время у хорошей Галин погиб. Вот какая жизнь как складывается, тяжело, да, тяжелая. Такая, вот такая, да.